Well, good evening and lovely to have you with us again this evening for our Wednesday evening Bible study. As you know, during the Wednesdays in October, we're looking at the first four Psalms and we've reached Psalm 4 this evening. Can I just mention to you that uh, we have finished now with our drive-in services down at the marina. For now, anyhow, we're moving back into our church building on this Sunday. Now, you do need to book, and many of you have done all of the places in the church building actually are taken up at this stage, but we are running a relay to the hall as well, and we can still fit some people in there. So do still contact us and book your place for Sunday, but make sure to book, to book before you come. And we do promise that all of you who will be in the church hall will be right at the top of the list and will be into the church building the following Sunday. That's a promise. Uh, now, just after this Bible study, if you're watching at the right time, at a quarter past eight is our Zoom prayer meeting, and we invite you to join with us for that. The other thing I need to say to you by way of announcement is that if you're planning to put in Christmas shoeboxes, you need to get those in before Sunday, <clears throat> before the end of the month. So to wait until Sunday is actually too late. We need them before that. Please uh, see to that. And so let me pray with you just for a moment before we turn to God's word. And so our Father, we thank you for your precious word. Oh Lord, how marvelous it is for us to have your word sitting in front of us and to hear your living voice. Come, we pray in mighty power and in a very personal way. You know all about us. You know exactly where we're at tonight and what things are very much upon our minds, what burdens are upon our hearts. And Lord, we ask that you would come and you would comfort us where we need that, that you'd challenge us where we need that, that above all, we would just know this very personal meeting with God as we turn now to your word. For we ask it in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. And so this evening we're turning to Psalm number four. The little title on it is For the Director of Music with Stringed Instruments, a Psalm of David. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger do not sin. When you are on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord. Make me dwell in safety. We thank God for his living word. The Psalms are the, the heart cry of a man walking with God. And we see all the experiences of life in there, the agony and the ecstasies, the joys and the sorrows. Sometimes the psalmist speaks to himself. Why are you downcast, O my soul, he says. Often he's speaking directly to the Lord and uh, at other times he's speaking to us who are reading the psalm. Here in this psalm I want you to see his praying, his preaching and his praising. Those are the three things we're going to look at in this psalm this evening. So first of all then, his praying. Verse 1, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> he says, Answer me when I call to you. O oh, my righteous God, give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. A number of the Psalms, quite a number of the Psalms actually begin with a cry of distress. Because here's a man who walked with God and yet he was tried and tested. The Psalms, you know, are not a remote 
paradise, but they are the real world in which we live. So for the whole of the scriptures, it's not something remote, but it's this, these scriptures are absolutely down to earth for the lives that we are living now. And David wrote here with his eyes wide open. Often as he wrote the Psalms, his eyes were open in tears. Often his heart was heavy and his hand was trembling and his eyes were weeping and his days were dark. There were hard times as he wrote these Psalms and yet he was able to write things like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I'll not be afraid when I go through the valley of death. I'm going to be in this house forever. A delightful Psalm. And so though his heart at times was heavy, we see this comfort and peace and assurance and calmness that he has. Often though he cries in distress and agony, yet that serenity and calm seems to come out over him again. Often though he starts off in a very sore way in a psalm, yet he ends in joy and triumph. And the secret of his peace, his assurance, his joy. What do you think was the secret of it? Well, the secret of it <clears throat> was that he never bore his burdens alone. Always he carried everything to the place of prayer. And verse 1 in this psalm is a great verse about prayer. Verse 1, answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. <clears throat> and there, I see four things immediately there that we find when we enter the throne room of God. Four things we find of the Lord himself. And the first is his presence. Look at verse 1. Answer me when I call to you. Do you see how personal that is? And how the psalmist is meeting in this very personal way with God, the very real presence of God in the throne room. The second thing you see here is the perfection of God. For he says, answer me <clears throat> when I call to you, O oh, my righteous God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's, he's, he recognizes as he comes to pray that he's coming to pray to one who acts perfectly, who is righteous in all his ways. And you see also when you come to the throne room, the power of God. Verse 1, answer me when I call to you, O oh, my righteous God, give me relief from my distress. And David is recognizing as he comes into the place of prayer that he's coming to a God who is able to change his situation. A God who is mighty to do marvelous things. And we also in the throne room in the place of prayer see the pity, the compassion of God. Verse one, answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God, give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. This lovely compassion of God that we meet, a God who is merciful and loves his people. Isn't it a tremendous picture that very personally in prayer we meet with God, the presence of God, that we meet with a God who acts only perfectly and only in a good way, a God who is able to do anything, who is powerful, and a God who loves his people very deeply and has the greatest pity for us. And therefore I ask you tonight, are you troubled? Are the burdens wearing you out and weighing you down? Does the way ahead seem dark? Listen, Jesus says to you in Matthew 11 and verse 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, come to the place of prayer. What a God we find in the place of prayer. What a harbour of safety in the raging storms. What are an anchor for our souls when life's billows crash over us. What a great protection for the saints of God. Are you proving it? Are you spending time in the presence of God? Oh, come tonight. Come tonight and spend time in his presence and just learn to lean. The psalmist there in prayer, the psalmist praying. <clears throat> but secondly, you see here, his preaching. He's got a word for us. In fact, there are three words in particular that he has for us here. In verses 2 to 5, this is. And the first is a word about sin. Verse 2, he says, How long, 
O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? And we're moving from the lovely, quiet, calm place of prayer in verse 1 to the field of battle as David addresses his enemies and sees them as mighty men. And yet, how pathetic and weak they look whenever he looks out from this place near to the heart of God. Though their lives are full, they think, yet in God's eyes, they are actually fools. And David challenges them here. He speaks out to these people who are challenging him. Verse 2, he says, How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Oh, what a deceiver Satan is. Because these people around David were thinking that their lives were so full and yet they were chasing bubbles. They were following shadows. They were building webs. And that's our world today where people, intelligent people, are chasing with all the energy that they have things that are fading. People are living for the things of this world that as though they would last forever, but they're actually passing away. What a deceiver Satan is. How easily he leads astray. How easily he makes people comfortable without God. How easily he blinds people's eyes to where it's all leading, to what the outcome of it is going to be. And so the psalmist is bringing us a word here, a straight solemn word about sin. Are you caught there tonight? Caught in that rat race? Oh, he says, get out of that. A word about safety then. Verse 3. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. To people caught in all that emptiness. What a magnificent alternative God sets out to us in his word. Here in verse 3 is the position of one who is walking with God in this fading world. Verse 3, know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Now, that's the picture of you, believer in Christ, you who've come to know the Savior. This is the marvelous picture that God has chosen you for himself. From eternity, God has set you apart for himself. God has bound you by covenant to himself. The God of the universe, the God who created all things, the one who is majestic before whom the angels fall in his presence, he has made you his personal possession and you're infinitely precious to him. And because of that, he tells us that nothing can separate us from his love. Not death, not life, not angels, not demons, not the future, not the present. Nothing can separate us from his love and no one can snatch us from his hand. And nothing can sever us from his grace. My name from the palms of his hands. Eternity will not erase. Tis written forever to stand in marks of indelible grace. Oh, dwell often upon this believer in Christ. And recognize this this evening, that even if you didn't have all of these promises of God in black and white, think of this. Would this infinitely faithful and perfect and true and holy one ever step back from his word? Would he ever break faith with his covenant? Would he ever disown his child? So quite apart from all the incredible, the great, many great and precious promises, says Peter, that are written in the scripture, part, quite apart from those promises in black and white, we go back to the character of God. And God would not let his people go. He could not. His character would not allow him to. But to crown it all, written over and over again in black and white for us. He has signed, he has sealed, he has sworn, he has promised us, promised it to us here in black and white that he will not let us go. Believer in Christ, 
how incredibly safe you are this evening. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. I don't recognize if you don't know the Lord this evening, how you're in the sinking sand, you're in the raging sea, you're going to be lost and you need to come tonight to rest on the rock and to be so safe and to be held in that everlasting hand. So the psalmist in his preaching brings us a word about sin, a word about safety, and then a word about salvation. Verse 4, he says, In your anger do not sin. When you are on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. David has set out, first of all, for us the sinfulness of the wicked. Then he has set out for us the safety of the godly just now. And now he shows us the way of salvation. How to cross over from the one to the other. Because sin traps man in a rat race. And so the psalmist says at the end of verse 4, he says, When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Because what sin does to us is it makes us too busy. And we're rushing. And we're buying and we're getting and we're having. Worldly people. And the psalmist says, stop. Pause. Hold it there. Sit still and think straight. Get alone and ask yourself where all of this is leading. And then he sticks in that little word, Scylla, which we think means instruments play on and give us time to think about that. Where's it all leading to? Be still, be silent, get alone. Because you see, the hustle bustle of the world keeps our minds off painful realities. The realities of life and of death and of eternity. And many people in our world today are afraid to be silent. Our young folk, so often they're plugged in. And all the time that they're not in their school class almost, they're plugged into their music. So often in our homes the TV stays on all the time. Because you see, to be alone in silence, for the unsaved particularly, is a frightening activity because it is then that thoughts about the purpose of life and the reality of death and the prospect of eternity can so easily come flooding into our minds and the unsaved dare not think about those things because they are not prepared for them. And so the psalmist, when he's giving this great warning here, he says in verse 4, when you're on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. He says it's important to be silent, but just thinking is not enough. Verse 5, offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Now, the gospel is in there. The wonderful gospel message is in there. Offer right sacrifices. And the scripture teaches us ever so plainly that there is only one right sacrifice that is able to make the sinner clean. And that is the great sacrifice offered on the cross of Calvary. I often quote these verses because they're marvelous verses. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11 that describe the other sacrifices that the Old Testament priests offer and priests of all sorts offer sacrifices. And here it says day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, this is Jesus, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made a switchstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And where the, these have been forgiven, there's no longer any sacrifice for sin, no need for sacrifices, no need for priests anymore. Because the one great sacrifice has been offered by the great high priest, Jesus. The sacrifice on the cross and Calvary is the only right sacrifice. Offer right sacrifices, says the psalmist. 
flee to Calvary, really. We, we could interpret it as we see it now, plainly, as people who live after the cross. Get to the cross. Look to Jesus. And maybe you need to do that tonight. Maybe you need to cross over. Maybe you've seen the solemnity of sin and what it does. And you've seen the glory of what it means to belong to the Lord, to be set apart for him. And you say, I'm there. I need to be there. And here the psalmist tells us, here's how to cross over. Go to Calvary where the right sacrifice was offered and trust in the Lord. Put your life in the hands of the Lord. The psalmist we see is praying, we see his preaching, and the last thing, quite briefly here, we see his praising in verses 6 to 8. Lovely end of this psalm. He says, Many are asking, Who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. He says there in verse 6, Many are asking, who can show us any good? So many people are searching for good, for happiness, for purpose, for satisfaction. And here he says, is the wonder of being a believer. We have found it all in Jesus Christ. Simply to have the light of God's face shine upon us as it does whenever the barrier of sin is removed by the sacrifice of Jesus whenever we've been born again then the light of God's face can shine upon us simply to have that is enough to know that we are his for all of eternity is all the good and the happiness and the purpose and the satisfaction that we ever need look at verse 7 he says, you, Lord, have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. Oh, he says, Lord, this is real joy. Folks, this evening to have Jesus in our heart, to have the Savior in our life is better than anything. Better than corn in the barn, says the psalmist. Better than wine in the fat. Better than cash in the bank. Better than goals in the net. Better than whatever you put in as the, the things that give you joy and happiness. To have Jesus in your heart better than any of these. It's better to enjoy the Lord Jesus Christ without anything else than to have everything else and not to have the Lord Jesus. And so, believer in Christ, think again tonight of Calvary and what it means to us, what the Saviour has done for us. Think again, just dwell on the gospel, just seep it up all again and say, oh, what joy. Verse 7. Lord, say it to him tonight. Lord, you have filled my heart with greater joy than when there are grain and new wine abound. The old hymn says, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. The very foretaste of heaven. And verse 8, the last verse, the psalmist says, I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Little wonder he can lie down and sleep in peace, knowing that he is the personal property and the prized possession of the God of eternity. From the Lord alone comes his safety and his assurance. And what a thrill now as he sings his song of praise. Oh, are you overwhelmed with the love of God tonight? Are you saying how good it is, how marvelous it is what he has done for us, how he has transformed everything for us? I'd rather have Jesus. Or the old hymn that I quote at times, maybe too often, but oh, it's great. It says, acres of diamonds, mountains of gold, rivers of silver, jewels untold, all these together couldn't buy you or me peace when we're sleeping and a conscience that's free, a heart that's contented, a satisfied mind. These are the treasures that money can't buy. Oh, if you have Jesus, 
There's more wealth in your soul than acres of diamonds and mountains of gold. Oh, what a great thing it is tonight to have the Lord. And so let us, like the psalmist, be in prayer in, the, in that throne room where we meet the Lord. Uh, let us hear also what the Scripture is saying to us. The psalmist speaks to us about sin and the solemnity of it, about the glory of belonging to the Lord and about how we cross over. And let us praise, that, like the psalmist, praise our great God for what he means to us and all that he's done for us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you tonight for the wonder of what you've done for your people. And Lord, so many of us sitting here watching can say, and that's me, because I'm one of those people. Oh, you've set us apart for yourself. Lord, we pray that we might know the joy then of the prayer place, of the throne room where we meet God, and that we might express our love for you as we praise you with all of our hearts. And if we find ourselves tonight yet without Christ, that this very night we may just kneel and take him into our lives and be born all over again. For we ask it in his precious name. Amen. So I remind you that our uh, prayer time is coming up now at a quarter past eight on Zoom. Thank you for joining with us this evening.